Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Um, I uh, have been uh, stated in the um, program as, as Emeritus Professor Gillian Triggs, and um, I'm reliably informed by a good friend of mine that Emeritus stands for has been, <laughs> a Latin phrase you may be familiar with. Um, I'm not quite a has-been yet. I've got another three weeks or four weeks left of my position as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, and it's a huge pleasure for me uh, to have the opportunity uh, to speak to the uh, Royal Australian College of Physicians. Uh, in doing so, can I uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, uh, to um, acknowledge the uh, traditional rights of the Wiradjuri people, and respect their elders, especially any who might be with us today. Well, in considering the moral obligations of the physician in the contemporary political environment, um, I'd really like to be able to thank you all for your support for the Australian Human Rights Commission and for our Forgotten Children's Report in 2014. Um, that the, the role of the profession in ensuring the credibility of that report was absolutely vital to the work of the Commission. Um, human rights, of course, is not for the faint-hearted. It tends to engage uh, the Commission in particular, and maybe me even more particularly, in the political debate. And that's a, a difficult environment to be in. But without the medical support for the work that we did for the Forgotten Children's Report, I think uh, the report would have had far less credibility. And I'll come back to that uh, in a little while. But the key point is that there's such strong respect for the medical profession in the Australian community that it gives its members a special capacity and importantly, the credibility to speak up for vulnerable communities. So I congratulate those of you from the um, Australian medical profession, from the, uh, generally, uh, from, the, um, uh, from this group of physicians for your professional support, which has really been, been absolutely exceptional. Um, perhaps one example, or just to, just to give this a practical uh, uh, illustration is the baby Asher case in Brisbane. You'll all be familiar there uh, with uh, uh, baby Asher who was uh, burnt uh, by boiling water in a tent in Nauru where her parents were being held for being um, an unlawful maritime arrival. And uh, members of the profession in Brisbane where she was brought for medical treatment uh, refused to allow her to be uh, discharged on the basis that she would be returned to Nauru where she would be vulnerable to unsafe conditions. Um, the evidence for that lay with the United Nations rapporteurs, with the various working groups, that the conditions in Nauru uh, in tents uh, in indefinite uh, detention were dangerous, particularly dangerous for children, and that in those circumstances, baby Asher was not to be released. And you'll be aware that the wonderful public support in Brisbane support these brave doctors for speaking up and speaking out, and of course, a very huge community support for their efforts. Um, it's interesting, of course, that ultimately, while the minister insisted that um, children like baby Asher and their families would be return to Nauru or remain vulnerable to being returned to, review, um, to Nauru, they were in fact allowed to remain in Australia um, in community detention or on temporary protection visas or bridging visas. Um, but the critical point is that speaking out um, can be enormously effective, particularly when the medical profession uh, relies on facts, on evidence, and are willing to speak up for children in these dire situations. But of course, speaking up is not a necessarily easy thing to be doing. Um, it does expose to political attention, and I think it perhaps has to be acknowledged that when you study a law degree, as I did in the 60s, uh, you know that law is always going to be a profession where you will uh, be required to stand up, whether it's for your client in a court uh, or even in the public arena. And you, you, you acknowledge that that's going to be part of your professional role. But I think for the medical profession, that's not really been an underlying purpose. You uh, study uh, science and medicine with quite different and essentially humanitarian objectives. And you don't really see yourselves as people who are going to be standing up in the media, um, as many of your representatives now do. 
uh, to draw attention to major social issues. So I think for that reason, uh, I do applaud the bravery of those of you who've stood up for issues like the Baby Asher case, but you'll also be aware that the whistleblower laws and the willingness of the medical profession to stand up uh, for uh, major social issues uh, was um, uh, stymied to a degree by the Border Force Act last year, last September, that imposes a penalty of up to two years imprisonment on immigration employees and contractors who disclose information obtained during the course of their work. Now, it's interesting that that uh, two-year prison sentence for disclosing information, um, particularly in the detention centers and in, um, and in offshore processing, Manus and Nauru, uh, applied to teachers, to social workers, to um, border guards, to those uh, um, security guards operating in all of these detention facilities, and also to members of the medical profession. But after an, 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 uh, an outraged response from the medical profession, it was decided that the health professionals will be excluded from the ban on speaking out. Now, that, of course, is important. It demonstrates, again, the point that I've made of the credibility of the medical profession. But it is, of course, uh, rather shocking that all of those others who might be willing to speak up, um, social workers, teachers, and others, uh, are still subject to up to two years uh, a prison sentence for speaking out. Now, of course, that's not been implemented, in fact, but it is and does have a chilling effect on those um, generally who have been willing to speak up. Of course, we are all aware of the phenomenon of, of false news, of alternative facts, and there was a notorious instance when the government alleged falsely that Save the Children had encouraged detainees in detention facilities to self-harm. It was only many months later that an inquiry was held to demonstrate that the allegation was totally untrue. The tragedy then is that the damage has been well and truly done, and indeed it's arguable uh, that elections have been won on the basis of comments like the alleged children overboard uh, um, allegations in 2001, again in the context of asylum seekers. The damage is done, an election is won, and an inquiry later demonstrates the truth. It's very hard to correct a false statement, especially if made by a senior politician, and in truth, uh, it seems, it, the truth is something you can get away with. Well, today, I would like, in, in the time that I have available, and before we open up the discussion with my, with my colleagues, uh, Peter, Georgia, um, uh, Brett, um, the, I'd like to raise two issues, one that I've really already touched on, the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees, and secondly, the indigenous health care and role of the Close the Gap campaign. Um, but in talking about the kind of work that went into the Forgotten Children's Report and the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees, I'd just like to make a, a general point, and that is that I'm not really talking about moral obligations as such. Um, as a lawyer and as an international lawyer, my concern is to talk about the human rights, which are legal, legally binding principles. Of course, the law uh, generally tries to follow uh, morality, justice, and ethics, uh, and in many cases does, but sometimes fails to do so. Um, but I'm talking about not anecdotal sentimentalism, I'm not talking about morality as such, I'm talking about the legal obligations that exist in some of the major international human rights treaties to which Australia's been a party. Um, it's true, I think, and fair to say that Australia has been a major player in the international human rights movement since the Second World War. And some of you in the audience might remember that rather irascible man, um, Doc Evatt, who, um, a brilliant lawyer, very determined, went to the United Nations um, and uh, was instrumental in negotiating some of the major features of the United Nations Charter, uh, but then went on at the uh, invitation of um, Eleanor Roosevelt to negotiate the terms of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And extraordinary, though it seems now, he was then the president of the General Assembly, and with his influence, he ensured that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted within the UN system without a single negative vote. Well, it was from that background then that Australia became 
deeply involved in establishing the international human rights legal provisions uh, that are of concern to me in the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Refugee Convention, the Convention Against Torture, uh, the Convention on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Rights of Women, uh, and the Racial Discrimination Convention, and of course, importantly, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, but the extraordinary phenomenon is that although up until the 90s, Australia was very strongly engaged in developing these laws, we have in the main not given those laws domestic effect in our, in our national laws. Now I know it's, a, it's rather a technical point, but it's an important one, that our, our diplomats can't go overseas and negotiate these human rights agreements without giving effect to them in domestic law by legislation through Parliament, which reflects, of course, the sovereignty of Parliament. So although my job as President of the Human Rights Commission is to call the government to account to comply with human rights standards based on those treaties, for the most part, those treaties are not part of Australian law. Uh, perhaps shockingly, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is signed, ratified and implemented by uh, the overwhelming majority of the world's uh, community, uh, Australia has not yet um, implemented that convention, nor has it implemented the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and most of the provisions of the Refugees Convention have now been stripped out of the Migration Act. So where I'm going to with this is to say that the laws exist in the international environment. Australia is bound by them, having signed and ratified these treaties, but they are not part of our Australian legal system, uh, which makes, of course, the job of the Australian Human Rights Commission a rather difficult one. But there are also other things that need to be understood if we talk about human rights, and that is that Australia is the only country in the common law world, and largely true of the civil law world as well, without a Bill of Rights. Um, our neighbours, New Zealand, have had a Bill of Rights for 21 years and they use it as a benchmark for all of their work. And of course, North America, United States, Canada, uh, all of Europe and the United Kingdom, most comparable legal systems have a Bill of Rights. We're the only common law one without one. But also, if you've ever looked at our Constitution, you'll know that we have very few rights in the Constitution. We have a right to freedom of religious expression. We've got a right to vote. We have a right to be compensated if our property is taken from us. And we've got a right to trial by jury if we are uh, accused of federal crimes. But we have no right to freedom of speech, and the High Court of Australia has implied a right of freedom of political communication. Well, you might say the common law will protect the, the rights, the human rights of individuals in Australia, but in fact that too has been stymied by the concept of supremacy of parliament. In other words, if parliament passes laws relating to let's say, suspension of the Racial Discrimination Act and the Northern Territory intervention uh, to protect children, allegedly, in the Northern Territory. Or um, we have um, other uh, uh, rights passed, such as the Migration Act and the mandatory detention policies. The courts, even our High Court of Australia, can do very little about it because that is the will of Parliament expressed in clear and unambiguous language. So we've really seen the legal system in Australia fail individuals in uh, failing to, to uh, provide the tools for our courts to implement fundamental rights. And we see that in perhaps the notorious cases that you'll be familiar with, the al Kateb case where um, a stateless ref refugee from, um, from Palestine was uh, held for four and a half, five years. Uh, and that was found to be constitutionally valid by the High Court of Australia, and more recently the M68 case, which found that retrospective legislation uh, allowing the government to send uh, asylum seekers and refugees offshore uh, was a valid uh, exercise of legislative power. Well, I won't uh, um, go, uh, go into the law in any, any further detail, other than to say that the medical profession is at the front line of understanding the health implications of refugee and asylum seeker status. And indeed, one of the tragedies of the position in Australia at the moment is that um, uh, tens of thousands, it's very difficult to get exact numbers, uh, but I believe something well over 20,000 uh, uh, people are in Australia, uh, in the community, uh, whose claims to refugee status have not been assessed. Uh, that is a fundamental uh, problem because without the status of being a refugee, many of the rights under 
Australian law and the Refugees Convention do not apply. I think you'll all be well aware that refugees and asylum seekers have suffered um, in many ways before they've come to Australia as a consequence of flight and displacement. Um, they're escaping danger, they've lived precarious existences, particularly they face poverty, marginalisation and threats of violence. Women and girls in particular are subject to sexual and gender-based violence. But once they come to Australia, and if they come to Australia in a way that allows them to have a proper status, then they do get high caliber settlement services within this country, and that's something that we can be proud of. In Victoria, the Refugee Health Program is an effective community health service that promotes accessible and culturally appropriate health care. We also have a network of specialist torture and trauma rehabilitation services across Australia, including Foundation House that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Uh, good research is being carried out across the country, including the Refugee Trauma and Recovery Program at the University of New South Wales. But sadly, for many thousands of uh, asylum seekers and refugees, they have arrived in a context in which they attract the mandatory and de facto indefinite immigration uh, detention under our Australian law. We're the only uh, comparable legal system in the world with a mandatory detention policy and one that is in too many cases indefinite. Uh, numerous studies have documented the high rates of mental health problems amongst people in immigration detention, ranging from depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, suicidal ideation, and self-harm. And we know that detention can be particularly uh, detrimental to the well-being of children. Well, our national inquiry, the Australian Human Rights Inquiry, into the uh, indefinite and, at that time, lengthy detention of children um, uh, became a very comprehensive uh, um, inquiry and led, ultimately, to, uh, to this report. Um, the key finding uh, in the report concerned mental health disorders uh, for children in detention, both in Australia and in Christmas Island, uh, at a level of 34% compared to a mental health disorder uh, percentage for children in Australia of 2%. Um, the United Nations Human, um, High Commissioner for Refugees has also visited the facilities in Nauru and Manus Island and has found that 83 of those surveyed, or 88% of those, suffered post-traumatic stress disorders and various anxieties. Uh, the UN has observed that the prolonged, arbitrary, and indefinite nature of immigration detention, in conjunction with a profound hopelessness in the context of no durable settlement options, has corroded the individual's resilience and rendered them vulnerable to alarming levels of mental illness. Well, the key point in conducting this inquiry uh, that was conducted throughout the country to every in detention centre uh, in Australia and uh, Christmas Island. It did not include Manus and Nauru because the government would not allow us to go there. Um, but critical to all of that work was that we took medical professionals with us. Uh, we visited um, nine detention centres and uh, I, with, with the staff of the Commission and medical officers, visited Christmas Island um, several times, three times in my case. Um, without those medical officers with us, I think it would have been extremely difficult to uh, understand uh, what was going on and to understand the seriousness of it. Um, I'm really delighted uh, today that uh, Professor Elizabeth Elliott is here. She uh, joined me in one of the visits to Christmas Island. Um, if it's not immodest to say it, I think the two of us were a force to be reckoned with. Um, Elizabeth and I insisted on going to all of the places that we were apparently going to be denied, uh, uh, but we saw um, levels of illness uh, that were, were quite shocking. I'm obviously not qualified to make judgments, uh, but I believe um, Elizabeth was, was prepared to say that every child she saw on that island was sick. And for me as a layperson, it was obvious to me that many of these children were in uh, very serious um, uh, states of, of neglect and, and depression. Uh, but perhaps what was even more shocking to my lay eyes was the, the position of the parents, uh, mothers who really could no longer make eye contact either with, uh, with me uh, or others of the team or even with their children, uh, were simply um, too sick and too depressed to, to respond at all. And the tragedy is, of course, that uh, 
uh, many of those children continue to uh, live on Nauru, uh, pending, of course, the outcome of, of American, um, uh, American uh, decisions as to which of them will be taken. My hope, obviously, is that those children will be taken away from Nauru, uh, but we were pleased that, uh, whether the government admits it or not, um, the children uh, have all been taken out of detention from Christmas Island and Manus and Nauru. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, an idea of what this is like, um, uh, and some of you may have experienced this in, in your own work uh, regionally and internationally, but as you fly into Christmas Island, of course, it's a, a, a paradise of an island. It looks like a jewel in the, in the Indian Ocean. But as you get closer and closer, you can see uh, the conditions in which uh, people are being held. We weren't allowed to take pictures with, um, with, with many people in them, um, hence these look rather pristine. But, um, uh, but the reality was uh, overcrowding in, in hot, um, um, reconfigured shipping containers um, uh, with very, very limited access to health care. Um, it was somewhat ironic that the, the rubber crabs there were protected by uh, notices. They were protected by legislation, uh, whereas, of course, the people that resided there uh, had very little um, uh, protection. Um, the, the, these are the sorts of comments that there we, from, from the children and their families. We found centipedes in our rooms. They, they grow to 30 centimeters and they sting. There are huge crabs in the camp. The robber crabs live under the huts and come out in cool weather. The red crabs are everywhere. And one parent saying, our son is frightened to go outside. He thinks he'll be dragged into the forest by an evil spirit and the animals will get him. I found that last comment quite uh, frequently repeated. Uh, there was a very genuine sense amongst the asylum seekers uh, on Christmas Island uh, that there were spirits in the, in the, uh, in, on the island and that they would, um, that they would take the children. Uh, this was oft repeated. Um, Christmas Island, of course, um, is a phosphate island with, with uh, uh, phosphate mines everywhere and, and uh, wherever you go, you will be covered with phosphate dust. Um, and, and they used to talk about the, the phosphate stripe because we would arrive with our black uh, Melbourne or Sydney clothes on and we would immediately have the, the phosphate stripe from anything we'd touched. But uh, medically, I don't know what the impact of that is. Maybe the research has yet to be done. But it was a shocking environment and, and these were the conditions again in Nauru. Um, but the, the critical point and the one that I, I really want to emphasize today is that Without the medical evidence from the medical advisors that we've taken, we would never be able to make our point uh, in the political environment. Um, to speak about the, um, as I can, can of course, about the, um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the prohibition on prolonged and arbitrary and indefinite detention, uh, that's not going to cut, unfortunately, very much ice. What really does matter is that a member of the profession is able to say these children are sick, their parents are depressed and ill, and that can have some impact at the political level. Um, impossible to be able to make a link between cause and effect, but it is, as I said a moment ago, uh, critically important that these children and their families are now out of Australian detention centres. The problem hasn't gone away. Um, there's, uh, the, in the sense that the detention centres now are filling up with um, 501 um, uh, visa cancellation cases that, again, from a legal point of view, are, are um, illegal. Uh, the minister has a personal discretion uh, to cancel visas on the grounds of character um, assessments that are not subject to judicial review. Now, they, again, these are legal points, um, not ones that the public is likely really to understand. But, the, but, the, but again, the difficulty is that while the numbers of asylum seekers have been declining, the numbers of those um, on uh, uh, visa cancellations on character grounds are going up. And we are currently conducting uh, detention center visits in, um, I've just done Villawood, we've done Mitre, I'm off to do Yonga Hill in Western Australia next week. Um, again, these are out of sight and out of mind for the Australian public, uh, but they are filling up with um, visa cancellations, many of whom, I don't have an exact figure, but something in the order of 35 or 40% are New Zealanders. And, um, and being New Zealanders, uh, they are in fact islanders. So the discriminatory impact of these policies is very clear in relation to Pacific Islanders uh, in Australian detention centres. Um, but they are, these are matters that become technical. 
uh, and we're now caught up in the put Australia first kind of an analysis where it's all about cancelling visas and, uh, and indeed reducing the 457 visa applications, uh, again, on what look to be uh, racist grounds. Um, you'll all be aware of the controversy yesterday um, with regard to a Labour Party ad. Uh, I think it's very encouraging that Mr Shorten has reacted very quickly and said that that ad uh, in talking about jobs for Australians being uh, apparently all, or with one exception, Anglo-Saxon, is something that he doesn't support. And he has moved quickly to, to, um, to pull that ad. But nonetheless, I think it's extremely worrying that we're seeing this, uh, this environment of um, nationalism, jingoism, populism, uh, that is being played out in a way that is uh, to a significant deg degree racist and one that in our experience at the Human Rights Commission is increasingly um, uh, Islamic, uh, based on some form of Islamic um, fear linked to, to other things. Um, well, the, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, um, where I know the medical profession can play such an important role in speaking up, uh, is the Close the Gap campaign. Um, the the treatment of the First Peoples in Australia is at the top of the most critical and moral obligations that I think we collectively share. Some of you will be um, aware that Australia, uh, every four years, goes through a review process in the United Nations, in the uh, Human Rights Council. Um, and uh, we've just been through a review process last November. It was confirmed early this year uh, where the Australian Human Rights Commission was able to make an intervention uh, but it was very interesting that of the 104 states that spoke about Australia's human rights records, and it's a peer-to-peer review process, uh, top of the list was the treatment of asylum seekers in detention and mandatory detention, uh, but very near uh, that list, the top of that list, number two, was the treatment of um, Indigenous uh, Australians. And it's something that the international community is acutely aware of, uh, but where we seem to have almost intractable problems in ensuring that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have access to good health care. Um, I think you'll all be aware better than I uh, that um, Aboriginal Australians live uh, between 10 to 17 years fewer than non-Indigenous Australians. Um, and uh, in uh, nearly every health and well-being measure, including child mortality, child malnutrition, obesity, diabetes and cancer, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders experience poorer levels of health. I don't, it certainly doesn't take a lawyer to say that in a country as rich and, and capable as Australia, these statistics are unacceptable. And of course, it's been true that respective prime ministers have acknowledged uh, that the Close the Gap campaign, funded by the government and chaired and run through the Australian Human Rights Commission, um, has been making some glacial improvements, but it isn't good enough. But the problem is that it's recognized every time the, the data and statistics come out, every time we report on these matters, we get an agreement that something must be done, uh, but we find at the same time uh, that that is not followed up with political will, and it's certainly not followed up with budgets, which um, with every, uh, every new budget, uh, we seem to find declining funds for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. So tonight's budget might be interesting to see whether, whether anything of that will change. Well, as specialist physicians and community leaders, you do have a privileged opportunity to understand what the health care gaps are and to speak up about them. Um, these are some of the statistics. I'm sure you're well aware of those. Um, and uh, we have the, the report by the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association. Um, they've been really very outspoken in saying that racism is a strong barrier to culturally safe healthcare systems. It's a rather shocking um, um, statement, but, but, it, but there is growing evidence to support this, uh, that the treatment of an indigenous person in the healthcare system uh, is likely to be influenced by racial discrimination. And the association has called for zero tolerance towards racism across the health sector to ensure a culturally safe healthcare system and to ensure that uh, Aboriginal uh, um, and uh, Torres Strait Islander health professionals are trained so that they can play a role in ensuring that cultural safety and health outcomes. Well, I think those points are really very obvious uh, to you. 
Um, there have been people speaking out. Um, the Royal Australian College of Physicians um, has spoken out on these issues. And uh, if I may to mention, I've been asked to mention and I want to mention uh, some of your fellows, Professor Noel Heyman, Dr. Tamara McKean, and Professor Ian Ring uh, have worked um, over the years on the Close the Gap campaign. Uh, they've been supported, of course, by um, Professor Tom Kalmer, as he now is. He was then the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. Um, the campaign has been running for 10 years. There are some improvements, uh, but they are extremely slow. And I think we need more leadership and, and more uh, evidence-based advocacy to encourage um, a recognition of the seriousness of the problem and the very important moral and, of course, legal obligation uh, to, to address the, the very significant differences in health outcomes for, uh, for um, Aboriginal Australians. Well, in conclusion then, thank you very much for uh, including me in this, in this conference. Um, I, I don't need to remind you of your moral obligations. It would be presumptuous of me in the extreme. Uh, you meet that obligation, there's no doubt about it. But, uh, but I would like to urge you to continue to speak up because your voice is a vitally important one. Uh, a political role is probably not a comfortable one. It's not comfortable for anybody, I suspect. But at the same time, your capacity to influence outcomes um, is, is very high. And, and so I do urge you uh, to continue to support medical research, to support a human rights law base to, um, to, to solving some of the problems that Australia has a, a deep uh, and, and a profound uh, res responsibility for. Um, so thank you for your leadership. Thank you for speaking up. Um, and thank you for, uh, for listening to me today. Thank you very much.